Welcome to 321 exams. Today, we're looking at the use of English. And our lesson for today is the comprehension passage. Now, the comprehension passage is, a, is the most important, or one of the most important aspects of the JAM English exams. Do you know why? Because it has the highest mark, which is a whooping of three marks. Now, it is pertinent that we understand what the comprehension passage is all about. And that will take us to, we're looking at the outline. What are the outlines we're looking at? We're looking at statements. What exactly is the meaning of statements? Now we're looking at the types of statements. Under the types of statements, we're looking at the indirect factual statement. We're looking at the implied statement. We're looking at statement of probability. We're looking at the direct factual statement. We're looking at the absolute statement of fact. We're looking at the non-absolute statement of fact. We're looking at the absolute deduction. We're looking at the non-factual statement. We're looking at the double negative statement. We're also last looking at the conditional statement. Once we are done with these various types of statements, the next we are to look at, we look at the mood and also the types of mood. Very importantly, a pivotal aspect of mood is the tone because we are, going to discuss, we are to discuss tone. Then once we are done with tone, we're looking at the types of tone. Under the types of tone, we're looking at the satiric tone, the sarcastic tone, the sermonizing tone, the non-committal tone, the tone of approval and disapproval, the historical tone, the analytical tone, the argumentative tone. Immediately we are done with the tone, we are looking at a very important aspect, which is finding the meaning of a word or expression as used in the passage, which I call the replacement of words. Then we are looking at suggesting a suitable or appropriate title for a passage before we look at the method of tackling the jump comprehension passage, which I call the men's method and the boys' method. So the first thing we have to look at now is to look at what exactly do refers to a statement. Now, statement represents the language the examiner uses to convey his message to the examinee. So I said statement. Statement is the language, the language used by the examiner to convey his message to the examinee. Now, look at it now. The first thing you must actually understand is that the examiner has the right to convey his message using various types of languages. Now, it is your duty to first understand or ascertain the language of the examiner because it is when you have understood the language of the examiner before you can understand the message the, the examiner is trying to convey. But most students find it difficult. Why? Because they just go straight to understand the message of the examiner without understanding the language the examiner has used to convey his message. And that is the reason why this particular lesson would discuss and explain all about statement. Now, as I said earlier on, that if you have seen some of your compression passage that you have read, you will have discovered that sometimes you read a particular comprehension passage for the first time. After reading it for the first time, you go back again to read it for the second time. Even when you look at the question, it's as if you have not even read anything in the examination hall. Now, do you know why such compression passage is like that to you? Because you have gone straight to just understand the message of the examiner without understanding the language the examiner has used to convey his message. So the first thing you must know is that what? The various languages the examiner can use to convey his message must first be ascertained before you can discover or understand the message of the examiner. So that's why I said statement here represents the language used by the examiner to convey his message to the examinee. So we're going to look at the types of statements. Types of statements. Types of statements. And we have about 10 types of statements we have to look at today. The first one is the indirect factual statement. Now, first is what we refer to as an indirect factual statement. This is also called a verbal irony in literature. Oh, you know, this is also called a verbal irony. Now, why do I call it a verbal irony? Because here, yeah, a writer says a thing, but means the opposite of what he has said. So once the writer says a thing and means the opposite of what he has said, such a fact has been expressed in an indirect manner. So the writer says a thing 
The writer says a thing, but means the opposite of what he has said. Now, this is called the indirect factual statement. Now, let me give you a, pure, a practical example before we look at even the jump past question. Now, you will discover that sometimes a, a mother will call a child and ask the child that, okay, Obi or Ada, please go and get me a bottle of oil across the road. While crossing the road, don't look left, don't look right, just cross. And while coming back, don't just carry the bottle of oil and break it and come back home empty. Now, in that regard, what exactly is the mother trying to tell the child? First, at that particular situation, the mother is trying to tell the child to be very careful. Now, why is the mother trying to tell the child to be very careful? Did the mother say it directly to the child that the child should be careful? No. The mother has said something but means the opposite of what she has said. So in that regard, we'll call that an indirect factual statement, whereby a fact is being expressed in an indirect manner. A writer says a thing, but means the opposite of what he has said. Now, taking a look at our past question, let's take an example to express or buttress this particular type of statement. If you look at Jam 1987, passage 2, question 7. From the particular passage, we can call it from the first paragraph that the writer said, you all know how friendly we are with the Okwere people. Do you think that any Umaru man who goes to prison there will come back alive? You all know how friendly we are with the Okwere people. Do you think that any Umaru man who goes to prison there will come back alive? The writer said, according to the passage, the people of Umaru and Okwere are A, are friends. B, are only acquaintance. C, are no friends. D, can never be enemies. Now, looking at this particular passage, what have we been able to see? Now, the first point here is, look at the language of the examiner. You all know how friendly we are with the Okwere people. You all know how friendly. Now, the writer has said something, but he means the opposite of what he has said. What did the writer said? You all know how friendly we are. So the writer has said a particular thing that they are friendly, but he's trying to convey to you that they are not friendly. So in that regard, what do you do in this situation? First, understand the language of the examiner. The examiner has used a particular language in this regard. What is the language the examiner has used in this regard? That firstly, we are friendly. You all know how friendly we are the Umaro people. Do you think that any Umaro man who goes to prison there will come back alive? In this regard, the examiner has stated a fact in an indirect manner. What is the fact he has stated? That the people of Umaro and Okwere are no friends. That's the first point. But come back and look at the options we have. A, are friends. That's not true. B, are only acquaintance. It's also not true. C, are no friends. That is the point. Now, why is that the point? Because the writer has said the thing, but means the opposite of what he has said. So the answer is what? C, are no friends. Look at number D, can never be enemies. It's also not true. Now, let me quickly teach you something that you will never learn anywhere apart from 3, 2, 1 exams. Now, look at it now. I'm going to teach you what they call the elimination method. The elimination method. Now, what do we refer to as the elimination method? The elimination method is your ability as a student to identify the odd option whenever you have been given a question. The jump exams, in most cases, is always interested in the ability of a student to identify the odd option. Which of the options do not follow the pattern? Which of the options do not follow the trend? So in most cases, once you see a question, the first thing you do is your ability to analyze the option. Now, take note, once you do not have the ability to analyze the options being given, there's every tendency you might not get the correctness of that particular question. And that will make you a very intelligent student. Trust me, the jump exams is purely for intelligent students. Now, what makes a student intelligent and what makes a student brilliant? I will tell you that in our next lesson. But let's move ahead. When I said, looking at these options now, we now have option A, our friends, this is positive. B, our only acquaintance is also positive. C, our no friends is negative. D, can never be enemies, is positive. Look at the examiner. He has given you three options that are positive. One option is negative. Which one is odd? The negative one. And that's why the answer is what? C are no friends. Thank you. Let's look at the next type of statement, which is the implied statement. 
implied statement. Now, under this implied statement, this is the most commonest kind of statement being used by the examiner when it comes to the comprehension passage. Now, why is it the commonest kind of statement being used? Because this is when a fact is not expressly stated in the passage. The fact is not expressly stated in the passage. Now, once the fact is not expressly stated in the passage, the fact can only be deduced. The fact can only be extrapolated by you looking at the basic pointers the examiner has given. Now, in this regard, the examiner expects you to reach a logical conclusion. What I call logical conclusion. Now, how do you reach a logical conclusion? You reach a logical conclusion by identifying the choice of words, which we call the dictions. The dictions of the writer. It is the writer's diction that helps you or enables you to look at what? To come to that logical conclusion. Now, why must you come to such a logical conclusion when an implied statement has been given? Now, the essence why you come to such a logical conclusion is because the writer has not stated the fact in the passage. What the writer expects you to do is to reach the logical conclusion from what has happened in the passage by you looking at the pointers the examiner has given to you. So which means the examiner will give you some pointers. It is these pointers that will lead you to that logical conclusion. So for you to reach this logical conclusion, the first point is to identify the pointers in the exam. Why? Because the fact is not expressly stated, but the fact can only be deduced from what has been stated. So the writer will state something, which is not the fact, but you can gather up those things the writer has stated to come to the conclusion or to come to the fact being expressed by the examiner. Let's take a good example. Look at this now. When we got to the spot, we saw an ocean of blood. Neighboring villagers stood near and prayed endlessly for the souls of the departed ones. As rescuers, we are battling to remove the remains of those who were trapped by the damaged vehicle. We all cried our eyes out. And I said, it can be implied from the passage. It can be implied. So an implied statement is that statement that should be gotten by looking at the pointers the examiner has given before you come to the conclusion, which we call the logical conclusion. It's also called inference. Now, looking at this now, let's break the passage down into pieces and come down to what exactly has happened in the passage. The first paragraph says, when we got to the spot, we saw an ocean of blood. Look at this now, ocean of blood. Neighboring villagers stood near and prayed endlessly for the souls of the departed ones. Souls of the departed. Look at this now. So what do you mean by souls of the departed? Some people have died. Death has taken place. As rescuers who are battling to remove the remains. What do you refer to as remains in English language? Remains means what? Dead bodies. Dead what? Bodies. Can you see my pointers now? Remains. Dead bodies. Of those who were trapped by the damaged vehicle. Damaged vehicle. We all cried our eyes out. Now look at the pointers that's actually underlined in the passage. And let's come back and read the options. Then I say it can be implied from the passage that A, there was a ghastly accident. Yes, there was an accident because of the damaged vehicle. That's a pointer. But is it a ghastly accident? We'll get there. B, there was a fatal accident. Trust me, there is an accident. So option A and option B should be considered. Number C says there was a traffic congestion. This is an error. It's an error. It's an error. D, there was a ritual killing. From what we have read, does anything suggest a ritual killing? I don't think so. So there was no ritual killing. Now, let me quickly give you another hint here. Now, at every point in time as a jam student, you must have the ability to eliminate two options. It is wrong for you to consider four options. Now, why is it necessary? In this regard, I will teach you how to eliminate two options. Now, the reason why you have to eliminate two options and consider only two options is because that if you consider four options, there's every tendency you might not get the answer correctly. 
But at the point whereby you are able to limit your options to two, there is every tendency you might get the answers correctly. So come back to this passage and see. Now, I've been able to eliminate two options. Why the two options have been eliminated now? There was a traffic conjecture, which is not true, because from what we have read in the passage, there was no logical conclusion from the pointers the examiner has given to suggest that we had a ritual killing or a fatal or a traffic congestion. So I've eliminated these two options, option C and option D. They are naturally wrong. Now let's come back to the two options we are meant to consider. A, there was a ghastly accident. B, there was a fatal accident. Now do you know why there is an accident? Look at the question. Who were trapped in the damaged vehicle? So because of that particular choice of words, which is the diction of the examiner, damaged vehicle, trust me, there is an accident. But you now ask yourself a question. What kind of accident? Because in this example now, we have been given two types of accidents. What are they? A ghastly accident, B, a fatal accident. Ask yourself, what is the difference between a ghastly accident and a fatal accident? Number one, a fatal accident is that accident that involves death. Number two, a ghastly accident is that accident that do not involve death. So wherever you hear the word fatal, it means death is involved. Wherever you hear the word ghastly, it means death was not involved. You could have a ghastly accident at home, no death. But once you say fatal accident, trust me, death is involved. And from the passage, what are the pointers that naturally denote that death was involved? Look at the first one, ocean of blood. Trust me, ocean of blood is not a pointer that actually suggests that death was involved. Because there could be an accident that there will be an ocean of blood and nobody dies. Yes, it's possible. But look at the pointers that shows that death was involved. We, have, we prayed endlessly for the souls of the departed. Souls of the departed, which means some people have died. We now say, wrestlers, we are battling to remove the remains. Remains means what? Dead bodies or those who have recently died. Now, these two pointers are the pointers that has brought us to that logical conclusion that what we had in that particular passage is a fatal accident. So the answer is option B, a fatal accident. Now, if you look at this particular passage, what have we discovered? Two things we have discovered. Number one, the examiner did not expressly tell us there was an accident in the passage. But we could deduce from what the writer has stated that there is or there was an, an accident. And the accident that actually happened in this passage is a fatal accident. This brings us to the end of this lesson. See you in our next lesson.